Imagine there is a row of slot machines in front of you. You do not know which machine will give you the best chance to win. How can you find the best slot machine to play with? What should you do to have a higher chance of winning? In a more common scenario, imagine you have various versions of ads or website layouts you would like to test on. What's the best strategy? This video will walk you through the Thompson sampling algorithm to solve those problems. Previously, I have made two videos on the intuitions of two very basic algorithms, ETC, Explore Then Commit, and Epsilon Greedy. Both of those algorithms take a long time to find the best slot machine, and sometimes they're not able to find the best solution. A better multi-armed band algorithm to consider is Thompson sampling. Thompson sampling is also called pos posterior sampling. It is a randomized Bayesian algorithm, which is easy to understand and to implement, and is a lot faster with log regret. Thompson sampling is also widely used in the industry for various use cases. For example, DoorDash uses Thompson sampling to dynamically learn which dashers are more responsive to messages, and then optimize decisions on who to message for a given time. Amazon uses Thompson sampling to select the optimal layout of the website and improved conversion by 21% in one week. Facebook uses a modified Thompson sampling algorithm called constrained Thompson sampling to optimize the quality of video in the video uploading process. Netflix uses Thompson sampling along with other bandit frameworks in their recommendation systems. Stitch Fix have added Thompson sampling to their experimentation platform. Let's first get started with some basic Bayesian statistics. Assume an arm can only give us a reward or not give us anything. The reward of an arm follows a balloony distribution with the parameter theta, meaning that this arm will succeed with a reward with probability theta and fail with probability 1 minus theta. If we play this arm n times, the total reward follows a binomial distribution with a parameter n and theta. Let's assume that the prior distribution of theta is beta with the parameter alpha and beta. Again, theta is the probability of winning for each arm. Our goal is to find what this theta is given our data. The probability of theta given y. Based on the base rules, we can calculate the, pros the posterior distribution of theta, which is proportional to the likelihood function in the prior. And then we can write down the equation for the binomial distribution and the beta distribution, which is then proportional to theta to the power of y plus alpha plus 1 and y minus theta to the power of m minus y plus beta minus 1, which is proportional to beta y minus alpha and m minus y plus beta. Interesting to note that the beta distribution is conjugate to the binomial family, meaning that if we start with a beta prior, we'll end up with a beta posterior. Here in the equation, y is the number of successes and m minus y is the number of losing which means that for each arm at each time step, if we get a reward, we add one to the first parameter, and if we fail, we add one to the second parameter. In the end, the first parameter should be the number of successes plus alpha, and the second parameter should be the number of failures plus beta. I will show you a concrete example next. Let's start with just two slot machines, or two arms, as an example. Note that we do not have the actual winning probability for two arms, but let's say they are 0.6 and 0.2. At time step one, let's assume that we do not have any prior information about the winning probability for each arm, and therefore let's just use beta 1, 1, uh, which is also the uniform distribution. Then let's randomly draw a sample from each distribution. For example, we draw 0.8 for arm 1 and 0.4 for arm 2. 
because point eight is greater than point four, we play arm one. With the unknown true probability of point six, arm one will give us a reward. Let's assume that arm one indeed gives us a reward. Then the posterior distribution of arm one updates to beta two one. At time step two, again, let's randomly draw a sample from each distribution. As you can see from the new distribution, arm one has a higher chance of drawing higher numbers. Arm two has equal chances to draw any numbers. Although compared to arm two, arm one has a higher chance to draw a larger number. Because we're sampling the numbers randomly, arm two still have a chance to draw a higher number. For example, we draw 0.7 for arm one and 0.9 for arm two. Because 0.7 is less than 0.9, we play arm two. With the unknown probability of point two, arm two will give us a reward. Let's assume that arm two failed to give us a reward. Then the posterior distribution for arm two updates to beta two one. At time step three, again, let's randomly draw a sample from each distribution. Assume we're drawing point eight for arm one and point three for arm two. We play arm one because point eight is greater than point three. Let's say this time arm one did not give us a reward. Then the posterior distribution for arm one updates to beta two two. And we continue this whole process over and over again. As the number of time steps increases, the posterior distribution should get closer and closer to the real values. For example, at timestamp 100, we could get beta 40, 30, for arm one and beta 824 for arm two. Note that those four numbers should add up to 104 since we start with beta one one for both arms. And then at time step 1000, we could get beta 432, 290 for arm one and beta 56 and 226 for arm two with the means of the distribution matching almost exactly the actual winning probability. The standard deviation should get smaller and smaller as time goes on, and the standard deviation for the winning arm should get smaller than the other arm, because in general, we should have a higher chance to draw a larger value from the winning arm, and thus we play that arm more often. But still, we will have a very small non-zero probability to play arm two, Meaning that at this point, we will mostly do exploitation instead of exploration. For Thompson sampling, there is not a finite cutoff as to when we do explore versus exploit, as you might have seen in other algorithms. In summary, Thompson sampling does the following. At each time step, we calculate the posterior distribution of theta for each arm. We draw a sample for each of the posterior distribution and play the arm with the largest value. In our example, we assumed that each arm at each time step follow a Bernoulli distribution, and the prior distribution of the probability of winning follows a beta prior. It is also common to use other distributions. For example, one can use a Gaussian distribution with a Gaussian prior, or other distributions in the general exponential families. Hope this video helps you get a better intuition and understanding of the Thompson sampling algorithm. I will link some references in the description box below if you would like to learn more on Thompson sampling or the detailed regret analysis. Thank you so much. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.